what happened last week. Have you all got amnesia? They just cheated us. This isn't fair. He didn't get out of the cock a duty car. <laughs> Welcome once again to The Cinephiles, where this week we are continuing our exploration of misery. My name is Steve Morris. I'm a filmmaker and directing instructor in Los Angeles, California. Hello, everyone. My name is John Roke. I'm a writer, producer, and host here in San Diego, California, and <sighs> trepidatious about walking into <laughs> or hobbling out of the ankling after we talk literally about literally going to make the same joke. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be tough, Steve. It's so funny how that scene, and we're yeah. going to get to it fairly soon, and that one couple of frames, I should have counted how many frames it is, just leaves a lasting impression on you. Yeah, forever. Um, but before we get going, we wanted yeah. to talk a little bit about some of the things that are going on on Patreon. Yeah, we had such a great time recently doing the live 300th episode celebration Q&A for our $10 and above patrons. That was so much fun. So many great questions that were asked by the patrons. And we it, these are the exclusive things. We just did a watch along for um, Air Force One, and we're looking to do a watch along, of course, in November for a movie as well. So there's more and more benefits coming down the road for you all who have been patrons. But for those of you who maybe been on the fence being like, well, I want a little more for my buck before I commit, we are absolutely working hard to create more things for you all to enjoy and more experiences uh, for you who are patrons so you feel like you are getting value for your patronage and support of us here on the cinephiles that's right we got shorts we got watch alongs we've got q a's that we're going to do more often and more in, in a more interactive way because it's a smaller group that's with us our special supporters on patreon yeah and of course there's always the opportunity to pick films that we're going to review so there's a lot of exciting stuff going on on Patreon. absolutely so thanks so much for staying on board with us for those who have and if you want to come on board you can go to patreon.com slash the cinephiles and pick a tier that works for you and we can have even more fun together, which is always a blast to do here on the show, Steve. Absolutely. But right now what we're doing is we're jumping back into bed oh. <laughs> where we're trapped with a psychopath <laughs> named Annie Wilkes. And where we left off, she had just been furious at Paul Sheldon because she read Misery's Child, saw that Misery had died, and finally revealed that she has told no one, no one that he is there. Yeah. And the last thing she said as she walked out... And you better hope nothing happens to me. Because if I die, you die. Wow. Reminds me of my tw dating in my twenties. No, just joking. That's a that's a that's a tough thing to hear. Wow, for sure. But I I love that this is the next stage of ratcheting up the tension and the um the, the terror, the horror that this man is in. It seems simple, but yet so devastating because it's something that you know is possible, uh, and certainly it is the fear of so many people to be in a situation where they are dependent on a person who does not have their best interests in mind. Well, and this is the thing. It's like I've said many times, I'm not really a horror guy. Mm -hmm. And this movie is exactly the kind of movie I love because it's such a great film. There's, And the thing is, it's not based on jump scares. It's not based on crazy monsters. There's nothing mystical going on. Right. It is creating a very realistic feeling situation where you are stuck with Paul Sheldon trying to figure out how am I going to survive? Yeah. And uh, we cut from Paul, who is basically sitting on the floor in agony in his locked room back to Buster, our sheriff who is talking on the phone to Paul's agent and basically saying, there's nothing going on. We've checked yeah. his credit reports. We've got no new information. Nobody's seen his car. And while he's talking on the phone, we see Annie Wilkes's car in the background. And I think that connection but that she's right there near our sheriff is a key thing to the story. Absolutely. Keep how close those are the great points in movies when you see how close yeah. the person chasing the person down is to catching the person or seeing the person while the person just kind of drives on by or moves on by uh, and uh, they don't quite catch them yet. And when last we saw Annie, she was absolutely terrifying and threatening. And now we cut to this extreme close up of her looking down at Paul, who's on the floor. You poor dear thing. What are you doing on the floor? No mention whatsoever of what happened in the last scene. Yeah. She, she's just moving on. And I, I love just watching her help him back into the bed and him being, and 
again, I've had this thing where they're going, okay, let me help you. And he's going, no, no, please wait, 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 wait. Because he just wants that second to yeah. gather himself before the pain. But she does not wait and says, you're such a crybaby. And she gets it in bed and she says, Comfy? Perfect. You're such a kidder. It's like a sweet little relationship. Yeah, with a completely unstable person. You know, and it's funny when you, um, now that we've become more aware of these terms, you know, as a society with gaslighting and with um, uh, kind of twisting our minds around and brainwashing and all that kind of stuff, um, you know, the Stockholm Syndrome thing we've talked, we've, uh, we talked about uh, on a previous episode a while ago. So this idea of be having your mind completely changed by someone who is in control of you, how you adapt to that situation. And you see here with Paul, um, he is trying all the tactics and she is trying to gaslight him like crazy to make him think, you know, that he is the one uh, kind of seeing this stuff happening, which isn't. So it's great. It's so funny. I never thought of any of that stuff when I first saw the movie. Right. And now in this world with celebrity stalkers and with, you know, like the, the, the toxic fandom and all these other things are sort of forcing me to look at this movie in a different way. And, the, and by the way, the other aspect of this film is when in addition to being about Stephen King's relationship to his work as a writer and what kind of work he produces, and in addition to him having, you know, getting letters from his number one fans yeah. and people obsessing about him personally, Stephen King was also in the midst of a pretty damn serious cocaine addiction at this time. Yeah. And so this is also a, a story about addiction. And in the book, it's much more, it's very clear he gets addicted to those drugs. And it's very clear that Annie uses them to punish him. Yeah. So in this scene, part of what she does is he takes she takes his drugs away for like two days. So he's in fucking agony wow. this whole time and dealing with withdrawal. And she does that multiple times in the course of the book. I have a big surprise for you. But first, there's something you must do. So I teach this scene in class. Hmm. This is a scene that I've broken down. It's funny. I have one assignment where I basically give out a description, a very vague description, and then ask the students of like five different scenes and ask the students to come up with how would you shoot the scene? And then I get to show them what the scene is. And so this is a description of somebody wants someone to do something and they threaten to torture them in order to get them to do the thing and then have people. Because I think the way that this is shot is so interesting and so simple in a way and so fucking scary because what she wants to get him to do is to burn his book. You don't suppose I could have a little snack? Well, I'm waiting for the surprise. I'll get you everything you want, but you must listen first. <laughs> I love this line, by the way. Sometimes my thinking is a little muddy. I accept that. That's why I couldn't remember all the things they were asking me on the witness stand in Denver. <laughs> That's just such a like little drop of like, wait, yeah. what did you say? Let me just drop this 10-pound hammer on the ground. Yeah. <laughs> Which I will later use to hobble your ankle. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> but this time I thought clearly. I asked God about you, and God said, I delivered him unto you so that you may show him the way. Dude, any time somebody says, God delivered me unto them, yeah, <laughs> it's pretty damn scary. It's unsettling, especially when you know they've got nefarious reasons for using the fact that God spoke to them. We're seeing that you know, in our world now, people saying that in, in interviews or social media posts, that God spoke to them about this, and yeah, no, no, none of that is true. Um, and I'm a Christian. I mean, yeah. I mean, as an atheist, I certainly believe none of it is true, <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of people do believe that's true. I know they do. Um, she wheels in, what uh, you know, a barbecue, one of those drum sort of barbecues, and it opens it up, and there is his briefcase and some lighter fluid and some matches. She pulls out his book, and she takes that lighter fluid, and she pours it on his book, and you see the lighter fluid go on his name and through the pages. When I mentioned a snack, I was thinking more along the lines of uh, cheese and crackers kind of thing. Paul, oh, this is no time for jokes. You must rid the world of this filth. And then there's a very specific shot, which is that it is an insert of her hands holding the book of matches and a match, and she pushes it forward towards the camera. And it is so recognizable and mm -hmm. odd, that shot. You know what I mean? It stands out in this very interesting way. I think every shot in this scene is selected. It's just fascinating. It's a way to bring you in and keep you at a distance. It's a very mm. smart approach by Reiner here. 
by having it go into the camera, because we we're seeing it through his eyes at times. The camera alternates. Sometimes we're watching them. Sometimes we're seeing it through his eyes. As you mentioned earlier, when he's lying on the ground, the camera is looking up and seeing her above him. In essence, we are him. So the combo right. of both is is really deftly done by Rob Reiner uh, to keep us close, but not close enough to help. And I think that's a great feeling for the audience to be in, to keep them in that state of suspended tension. Um, and this moment, yeah, right here, this moment is so fantastic. Because what's so quizzical about this scene is that Paul, he doesn't scream or yell or, st- you know, like, no, he just kind of rolls with what she's doing. And maybe there's almost a f- fatalistic approach from it yeah I, I stupid me to think that i could break out from misery like duh, how dumb of me of course of course uh, uh we're gonna set it on fire of course things will work out to the point where i would destroy the thing that could keep could get me out of the misery writing business and an obsessed fan is now going to turn me back into writing the misery sh- the misery books you know I, I just love the fact that it's such an alternate decision by him and by reiner to have him not react in such a strong way. Well, I think, well, this is why I really love this movie. And, and is that, first of all, it really puts you in this position of him and going, okay, what do you, what would you do? Yeah. How are you going to get out of this? And I think that you can see the wheels continually turning with James Caan. That's what makes his performance so great is he's, he knows if he yells, that's not going to help him. Right. You know, if he screams, it's not going to help him. He can't get violent with her. He's totally helpless. And so he see him thinking through what the fuck am I going to do? How am I going to get myself out of this? And and one of the things about it is I think part of why I'm so drawn to this movie is it's an editor's film is that this Ooh. is shot reaction shot. Here is the he's very clearly showing you every single important detail. This is also why this is a Hitchcockian film because right. Hitchcock always wants you to see. Here's all the things you need to know. Yeah. Uh, the editor, by the way, is uh, Robert Layton, and I think he does just a fantastic job. Agreed. You want me to burn my book? I know this may be difficult for you, but it's for the best. And you see him think, yeah. and then you see him come up with a lie. And we've talked a lot about lying on this show and this is this is how i'm not saying just that that it's a good lie because the lie obviously falls apart but Mm -hmm. but that this is how you do lying in film is you see him trying to come up with the thing and then you see him trying to sell that thing to her and you see the layers of him being upset because of course he you know it's not really true it's it's really not difficult at all my agent made dozens of copies there's going to be an auction in new york every publishing house in new york is reading it now so if you want me to burn my book fine you're not really ridding the world of anything now does she know he's lying yes right from the beginning i think so right from the beginning she absolutely does someone Uh, who studies you that deeply is going to know all your tells yeah when you're on interviews when you're i mean she probably has watched everything possible or read everything possible on him and so and being a nurse, she's probably heard people lie to him, lie to her oh. her whole life, you know, about pain or about what they need or what they don't need. So she's attuned to that uh, from the beginning, in my opinion. Then light the match, Paul. It's no big deal. So you vindicated. Do it. And then you see him hesitate, which of course blows the lie. And then she reveals it's just as you said. She saw him at an interview. She knows he's never he doesn't make copies because of something she said to Merv Griffin 11 years ago. And now we see, you know, that shot that's happened twice of her holding out the matchbook, the box of matches to him. Now she puts the box on his chest and she puts the match between his fingers and they're just out of focus. And one of the things that they're doing is they play with focus. So sometimes it's you see the match in the foreground out of focus and Paul in the background in focus. Sometimes you'll see the match in focus and Paul out of focus and all that's very conscious. And then what she does next and the way they film it is so fascinating that she starts pacing and at the bottom of the frame in her hand, casually, I would say, you see her squirting lighter fluid on him on the bed. Can't you see it's what God wants? You're so brilliant, I would think you'd certainly be able to see that. Why do you think they put... Norm, because, again, this my brain goes, well, I'd want that lighter fluid can in the center of the frame. Mm. So you're really looking at it. But that's not where they put it. They put it at the bottom of the frame. It's so That it ends up being kind of almost like it's not important. Why do you think the choice is to put it that way, to film well, it? Well, I, I think it is important because um, 
the the combo of it, you don't want to take attention away from what she's doing in terms of walking and the things she's saying. But having the um, lighter fluid, it, it works in concert, just like the spilling of the soup on the bed works in concert yes. when she is getting upset. So to me, that's both of those things are happening at the levels that they need to happen because um, great tension is built from the fact that so many things are happening at once, you can't react to it. You're just kind of like overwhelmed by it all. And certainly that's what's happening to him now, because not only is he facing burning this thing that was going to break him out of the misery business, his only copy, by the way, which is everyone's greatest fear. I mean, people, writers lose their fucking minds when their files get corrupted or whatever from something they've been working on for years or for months or whatever. And then the other part of it, she is essentially throwing lighter fluid on something could happen where he could set himself on fire as well as setting the manuscript on fire. And really that's metaphorical, that's metaphoric and symbolic in so many ways because setting that the book on fire is in essence setting himself on fire. And so there's a lot of meaning in this scene for sure. So I want to go back to the lighter fluid in a moment, but do do you know the he- the Hemingway story in Paris? Uh no, I'm only halfway through the documentary on uh, on PBS, the Ken Burns oh, one. Well, so. they they're going to talk about it and they'll and I'm I'm not going to get the facts exactly right, but something like Hemingway had been in Paris writing with his wife there for like a year, had all these short stories. He went on a trip or something, and then she was going to go meet him, and all of his short stories were like at their apartment, and she decided to bring them with her to him, and she lost them on the train. Oh! Like a year of Ernest Hemingway's writing or something like that. It's a, and I, Again, I don't have the details exactly right, but it's something like that. Well, and what's funny is he said, I mean, it's one of the worst things and it, you know, fucked up their marriage and it's, you know, it's a big deal. But he also said, like, he became a better writer, like, you know, on some levels, maybe it was a good thing. Um, uh, Back to this lighter fluid. It totally relates to the soup. It also relates to the, you know, the bottle with the urine that she was shaking over him before. But what it also does is because she's talking, it's like her head isn't aware of what her hand is doing. You know what I mean? Like, like, and, and of course she is aware, but it's just so disconcerting. I mean, she's go, she doesn't say I'm going to light you on fire and burn you alive in this bed. If you don't do what I say, she's just talking. We're put on this earth to help people, Paul. Like I'm trying to help you. And just watch James Kahn's eyes and his taking this in and trying to figure out what to do. Please help me help you. And there's a long look, and he realizes there's no choice. There's nothing he can do. And he lights that match. And by the way, if I was lying in a bed covered in lighter fluid, I would not hold on to that match that long. (laughs) I would be really scared. But I mean, you know, as a creative, the self-destructive impulses are always there. And so him holding on to the match in a way I think works because... Do you think he's thinking about killing himself? At yes. That moment? Yes. Oh, because yeah. this is the end. That thing being burnt up is the end of his escape out of this life. You know, that scene with him and Lauren Bacall is so essential in the movie. When we see it in flashback earlier in the mm. film, it's, you see his desperation that he never yeah. wanted to be writing these kinds of books. And so the chance to break out of it is so powerful. And, in a way, this is almost like a Shawshank Redemption kind of film. He has to crawl through this snow-covered river of shit yes. just to come out clean on the other side. Clean-ish. Clean-ish, yeah. yes. Clean-ish. Um, and then he tosses that match. It bursts into flames. Oh, my goodness. Goodness gracious. It, that, again, we're back to that cutesy thing. Yeah. Drags the barbecue away. Flames and embers are flying up. And by the way, what you're not seeing is that off camera, there are a bunch of crew members with fishing lines holding on to little embers, making them float around because that's what we do when we're making movies. That's great. You know, finally, the, most of the fire goes out and she pours water on the script. And her last thing she says is, well, isn't that a movie mess? And then we hear the sound of a helicopter. Loud. Yeah. And they look out the window And by the way, this is this thing I said before, 90% of this uh, scene was shot on a set in a movie studio in Hollywood. Mm. As soon as you look out the window and see the helicopter and they're looking out the window, it's when they've transported the entire set to the location Mm. and they're out in the mountains somewhere looking out the actual window. And we cut to inside the helicopter, Richard Farnsworth and his helicopter pilot, Rob Reiner. Yeah, that was great to see. 
<laughs> oh, that's a good little cameo. And they're looking around and not finding anything. Back in the room, they watch the helicopter going away. And Annie says, I do believe the winters are getting shorter and shorter every year. People say it has something to do with the ozone layer. What do you think? Can you imagine you've just been forced to burn your life's work? All right. That's gaslighting, someone... isn't it? Let me destroy <laughs> something you love, and then let's have a real nothing conversation to make it seem as it was not that big of a deal. Uh, it's just, it's real psychological shit that she's doing. And and, I, and he just kind of, dead, you know, in a dead way, he yeah. says, I don't know. And I love her line where she goes, yeah, well, it's a theory. I don't know why that strikes me funny, but it does. She gives him his pills. She leaves the room and he is about to take the pills. And then he thinks and he puts the pills under the mattress. Yeah. She's watching Love Connection. I love all the little details that she's eating a bag of Cheetos. She's got a big two liter bottle of Coke and her big stuffed animals around her. <laughs> and he's alone. He's got two more pills and he grabs his fork, punctures the side of the mattress and stuffs his pill in the mattress. Yeah. And it's like, oh, Paul's coming up with a plan. Yeah, he's trying to break himself of this addiction. And now it's later. Well, and it's not. I don't think it's just that he's trying to break. Do you think he's already thinking about drugging her at this point? Oh, yeah, I think so. But yeah. he's also, I think he's also trying to be clear headed. Oh, yeah. So in I, a way, I, trying to kind of keep himself not too addicted to these things. Well, I think the burning the book scene was transformative in mm -hmm. the sense that he went, oh, if I'm ever going to get out of here, the only way I'm getting out of here is by myself. Like, yeah. I got to figure this out. No one's come to save me. You just sit tight and I'll set everything up. Set what up? Your new studio. After all, writers do need a place to work. But by the way, James Conn was really happy to get out of the fucking bed. I bet he like, was. Yeah, yeah. Just to be in a chair and not in a bed was a relief at this point. Oh, but Paul, I don't think I know. Now that you've gotten rid of that nasty manuscript, you can go back to doing what you're great at. You're going to write a new novel. Your greatest achievement ever. Misery's Return. <laughs> it's just the level of craziness that Paul's in the middle of at this point. Yeah. You do understand that this is not the ordinary way in which books get written. I mean, some people might actually consider this an oddball situation. And she goes out to get something, and he looks down, and there on the floor is a bobby pin. Mm -hmm. Something he can use. Yeah. yeah. I got you this expensive paper to type on, and I got a great deal on this 50-pound clunker on account of it's missing an N. <laughs> Typing without an N is like, that's really hard. <laughs> Did I do good? You did great. And then, and again, I think now the wheels are turning. And I think maybe yeah. it is because of what you said, that he's not on drugs anymore, that his brain is a little clearer. He says, there is just one little thing. Um, I can't work on this paper. See, it's graspable bond and it smudges. And watching Kathy Bates deflate. And completely uh, move to a, a back to being the angry cat, uh, angry Annie Wilkes. Yeah. But mine costs the most. So I don't see how it can smudge. Come here, I'll show you. And I love, he puts a piece of paper in the typewriter, types the word smudge, and then smudges it with his finger. Yeah. And she, the flatness of the way she responds. Oh, it does smudge after all. Isn't that fascinating? And you could feel the danger signals. Yeah. And this is something that is definitely in the book where Paul can see uh oh, we're heading in that in that bad direction, and trying to get her to veer off at times as she becomes more flat and dead and disconnected. Anything else I can get while I'm in town? And I'm like, danger, danger, danger. <laughs> Any other crucial requirements that need satisfying? Would you like a tiny tape recorder, or how about a handmade set of writing slippers? And Paul's trying to like calm her down. Annie, what, what's the matter? And then we're back in that place, man. What's the matter? I'll tell you what's the matter. I go out of my way for you. I do everything to try and make you happy. I feed you, I clean you, I dress you. And what thanks do I get? Oh, you bought the wrong paper, Annie. I can't write on this paper, Annie. Well, I'll get your stupid paper, but you just better start showing me a little more appreciation around here, Mr. Man. Slams the box on his legs and storms out. So what do you think that's all about, Steve? I think. Because he's not wrong. He showed her. 
She saw it for herself. It's not a lie, the smudging. She didn't know what paper to get him. Do you think this is an insult to her because she studied him for so long? How could she make such a simple fuck up? Do you think it's about that? Or do you think this is an, like she's angry that she has to get, go back out of town or she not trust him? What do you think this is all about? I think, I think it is exactly what she said it's about. Because I think in Annie's brain, she has walled off the ways that she has tortured him and kidnapped him and is a horrible person. And in her mind, she has taken good care of him. She's saved his life. Why is he so fucking ungrateful? Right. I really think she's not seeing, you know, I don't think she remembers slamming or part of her brain doesn't re- won't remember that she slammed this box on his yeah. wounded legs. You know, what do you think? No, I mean, th- to me, I think it's, I think it's uh, a, the feeling of rejection by someone you, you are, uh, have an unhealthy addiction to. And when you make a simple mistake like this, uh, it affects you personally. And so your reaction is not, cause you're not a stable person. You're going to react in an angry manner initially, you know, and then turn it around on him, right? This is more gaslighting. It's your fault, Mr. Man. You need to show me some appreciation and Paul said it nicely. So this is all in her head and it may be her inner voice that bashes her all the time or makes fun of her all the time or warps her mind all the time to do something like this that is coming out in a, um, in this explosion, you know, her, um, inner voice that is so, uh, cruel. Well, and I'm assuming that even when not dealing with a total psychopath, Mm. you've had an argument with someone who Mm. asked for proof on a certain thing and you proved that you were right pretty clearly and they do not accept the proof and are just continue to be pissed off and yell at you and ignore the thing that they asked you to show. Again, dating in my 20s. No, uh, no, uh, this is essentially... A lot of Twitter battles that I have. So, yes, I agree. Yeah, that's absolutely true. You can show them stuff, but some people are so dialed into the lie that they've believed or dialed into the thought patterns that they need to function that they are unwilling to uh, possibly question um, their stances on things. And I think that's, you know, it's unfortunate and it's sad to see sometimes because, uh, you know, you can be being challenged with what you believe in is a way to kind of expand your mind. Yeah. And in this moment, she could easily have been like, okay, uh, my mistake, I'll go get you the paper you want. But she reacts strongly like this because she's embarrassed. Now, did he do this whole paper thing in order to get her out so he could get to that safe, that pin? Uh, no, I think he was right because obviously he'd smudged. He's probably never used that paper because he probably tried to write something one time and it smudged. And you know how particular writers can be. So, this is something sure. when he saw that he knew immediately, you know, I think it's both. I think he definitely doesn't use this paper. He doesn't like this paper, but I think it's all about getting her out of the house so he could pick up that Bobby pin. So maybe it was a, a, a like it was a, a godsend of a moment in that. Yeah. Well, for lack of a better term, you know? <laughs> um, so I want to talk briefly about screenwriting because it's something it came up, I think in our, our last Q and a mm-hmm. where someone was asking a screenwriting question and it, it suddenly occurred. I don't think I've ever talked about this, which is that people tend to think about screenwriting is I'm writing all the dialogue. Yeah. But screenwriting is writing a whole bunch of stuff and there's all and frequently it's writing the action and there's all these weird challenges of writing screenplays, one of which is that neither directors nor actors generally want to be told exactly what to do or exactly what they're feeling. Like if you got a script that said your character is deeply upset, weeps, brings his right hand to his face, covers his face and cries because he's thinking about this and this and that you would be like, fuck you, screenwriter, you know? (laughs) Like that, you wouldn't, I'm assuming that you would not like that. Yeah. Um, And directors don't like a screenplay that says camera cuts to a 22 millimeter lens as it pushes in on their face. And then, you know, you know, directors don't want that either. And so you're freak, but you do have to describe most of the things that happen and anything that's critical to the story is usually in the screenplay. Yeah. And so, so much of this movie are little things that are done that are critical to the story. And so, and, and the other thing is, is you want to actually make your screenplay entertaining to read, which is hard to do because the screenplay is not the most entertaining format. Yeah. And there, you always have to keep the length down 
So because the assumption is that uh, it's something like a page a minute. So if you wrote all the details you wanted and your screenplay was 300 pages for your 90 minute movie, no one's buying or even reading that fucking screenplay. Mm. And so there are all these pressures. And so I wanted to talk about what William Goldman does and does so well. So first of all, he gives tons of credit to Stephen King. He thinks Stephen King's a genius. And he says a lot of the really good ideas of stuff that's happening come directly from Stephen King. Mm. But now we have this moment where Paul is going to just reach down and try to pick up that bobby pin. Right. And I found the screenplay. And this is how it's described in the screenplay. Oh, okay. He says, Paul, as he moves towards the bobby pin, or tries to, it's brutally hard for him. The chair moves half a foot, stops. Paul strains again. Another foot, stops. Another. Cut to the bobby pin. The wheelchair is beside it now. Paul reaches down for it. Can't make it. Tries again. Can't. He takes a deep breath, forces himself to bend, ignoring the pain. The bobby pin is in his hands. That is a great description of a little bit of action. Yeah. And the thing is, and if you watch the movie. Cotto. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is like one of the techniques, one of the techniques I like, and actually William Goldman doesn't do this. I tend to put things that in my mind are different shots on a separate line. Mm. So that you can see the specific actions. Oh, interesting. Um, okay. There's all sorts of little tricks that people do. Like, for instance, he has the cut to, and he says, the bobby pin. And the bobby pin is in capital letters. And part of that is for the prop guy to spot that and know that he has the bobby pin. And it's also, this is plenty. So I wouldn't say cut to angle, high angle on the bobby pin with this lens. That's telling the director what to do. But cut to the capitalized bobby pin is giving the director a clue right. <clears throat> of what I want them to do without telling them what I wanted them to do. Like, for instance, if I wrote a direction that said, um, John is absolutely terrified and his hand is shaking as he reaches for the bobby pin, I would not be a great, I would not think that, that was right, a good direction. Mm -hmm. But if I said, John focuses to steady his hand and keep it from shaking before he reaches for the as he reaches for the bobby pin, I think that would be a better direction. Because one, I told you, your, I made it you. I told your character how you were feeling and right. what you did. And the other one, I told you, it gave you an action to overcome, stop my hand from shaking, you know? And that's, those are the things that screenwriters spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to write. So they're clear, but not too specific, you know? <laughs> it's a weird challenge. No, I'm sure it is. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, how William Goldman approaches this is he said he read the book, he reads, a, if he's adapting a novel, he reads it over and over again. Mm. And each time he reads it, he reads it with a different color pen. And he writes notes, either circling lines or writes notes in the margin. And then he reads it again, now with the blue pen. Now he does it with the red pen. And one thing he knows is as he pages through the book, if there's a page that has a whole bunch of different colored pen marks in it, that scene's probably got to be in the movie. Wow. Because it's one he went over a lot. Right. So he grabs that bobby pin. He goes to the door. He puts it in and drops the bobby pin. <laughs> and it's all its all the little details, man. It's all the little, fuck, now he has to try to pick that thing up again. Yeah, great tension. Picks it up. And I love that as he's trying to pick the lock, he goes, Come on, you've written about this, not do it. And then the joy when it actually works is so great. And again, I'm going to read, now he has to get out of the door. And I'm going to read one more piece of description from the screenplay. Okay. Paul, trying to get out of the room. But it's a bitch, because in order to get, out, get to the lock, he had to move the wheelchair up to the door. And in order to get out, he's got to maneuver it out of the way of the door. And every turn of the chair's wheels is an effort for him. He works at it and works at it, but his energy is failing him. He's pale, perspiring. Finally, he succeeds, barely forces his way into the hall. Hmm. It's good screenwriting, man. Yeah. There's a reason that William Goldman is was one of the best. Yeah. All right. He comes out. This is so Hitchcocky to me. Mm -hmm. We don't know when Annie's coming back and all the little details of him going through this room. Yeah. Getting a little more background on, on her. Yeah. Yeah. Finds another lock room. Can't get out that way. He's wheeling forward. He sees the phone. There's a jump cut to the phone. He goes over quickly to the phone, dials zero. Picks up the phone. It's an empty shell. By the way, uh, Rob, Rob Reiner says he feels like this is their one cheat in the movie that he they couldn't figure out how to get away with it. That yeah. doesn't really feel that realistic that she has no phone. Yeah. But this is 
this is, you know, what they had to do. And then we cut to Annie and she's walking out of the store and with a paper and she gets into her Cherokee and she's heading back. The thing is, we don't know how much time has passed. We don't know how long it took her to get to the store. So we don't know how much time Paul has left, but we know she's coming back. Mm -hmm. And then Paul is wheeling through this very cluttered, very well decorated for Annie room. Mm -hmm. And there is a little tiny ceramic penguin on the corner of a table and his foot hits it. And the shot of him catching that thing and he puts it back and we go, whew. And we don't know that he's put it back the wrong way. It's a great, quick seed that is planted in that moment. Yep. Uh, And we see Liberace is one of her heroes. And then we see this basically altar to Paul Sheldon. Yeah. And then he goes through another door and finds a bunch of drugs. And grabs a bunch, which in the book, he really is a drug addict. So that, yeah. that has a kind of a double meaning there. Then we see Annie driving, and the music is ominous, and the music is building. He opens up the door to the kitchen and sees another door on the other side and starts to roll forward and can't get through it. And then you see him pull his feet off of that wheelchair. And you go, oh, no. Mm-hmm. He drops him to the ground, and he is crawling across the floor. And Annie is coming back. This whole sequence is so tense to me. Yeah. And he he tries to open up the door. That door is locked too. And then he sees the knives. And then we hear the car coming and go, oh, shit. And now the music is really going. And he's dragging himself across the floor and pulling himself into the chair. And she's parking the car. He's racing through the house. She's walking up. And it's just all the shots, every single shot and pacing of this is so well done. It's so perfectly constructed. And as he's going through, he realizes he's left the door open. So he goes to close that door at the moment that she drops a ream of paper. You know what I mean? It's like all those pieces. And apparently this took a long time to edit because it's like, well, yeah, because it's figuring out, well, exactly where is she at which moment? Yeah, you know, and getting it exactly the right distance so the timing all feels right and the tension keeps building is really hard. Yeah. And he gets through the door, he's locking it with a pin, it's intercutting to her coming in. Oh, I've got your paper. And she's walking towards him, and just as she's opening the door, he realizes that his little pack of pills in his waistband is sticking out. And as she comes in, he covers it and he looks terrible. Paul. I love the way Kathy Bates says this line. You're dripping with perspiration. Your color is very hectic. What have you been doing? And this moment, because you're like, oh, fuck, what's he going to say? And what he says is the perfect answer. You know damn well what I've been doing. I've been sitting here suffering. I need my pills. I think this is such a brilliant lie because it ex- he is using his vulnerability to lie yeah. to her. It also makes her feel like sh- he needs her even more. Yeah, he needs her even more, which in essence is what she wants. Um, by the way, so in the book, she had been withholding pills from him at this moment. And so when he found the pills in the, in the bathroom or whatever, he took four of them. Because he was in so much pain and he's a drug addict. So now when she comes in and he does this lie and begs for pills, he takes two more. So cool. he's high as a fucking kite yeah. after this scene. Um, and, and, and the vulnerability and pain that James Conn shows in this is really great. Yeah. I want my pain to go away, Annie. Please make it go away. Now, William Goldman says that she saw the penguin in the wrong position right in this scene and already knows that he's been out. Yeah, I would agree with that. I didn't feel that way, but I, too, I mean, it makes, yeah. Yeah, too much of the film is, is um, how can I say this? The audience buys too much that Annie is a step behind, but Annie mm. is aware of everything that he is doing. And I mm. think because um, she is so in control of her world and so in control of him, that she doesn't need to act on this stuff immediately. When it hits critical mass, then she'll address it. But until then, she's the one holding all the cards. And she knows it. And so I think the rearranging stuff, oh, it makes Paul would get out. But if nothing's missing, nothing's wrong, nothing's different, then you know all he did was realize how much of a shitty situation he's actually in, which may, may make him more docile. 
Uh, this brings me to a, I've got a whole other question for you. I think you're mm. totally right. And mm. I think I've been really dumb about a specific moment later on oh. that I will ask you about when we get there. Sure. So, and, and then she says, and again, it's that different. It's just what we saw before. We saw her really fucking scary. And now she's being nice. And I'm absolutely certain the main reason I've never been more popular is because of my temper. You must be so mad at me. The truth now uh, and I love that he goes, well, you know, who doesn't let off a little steam every once in a while? <laughs> yeah. And she helps him into bed. She gives him a notepad in case he comes up with something he, you know, notes he wants to take. And by the way, the shot of him offering the notepad is exactly the same shot of him offering the box of matches. Oh, okay. So I bet it's the same lens. It's framed oh, yeah. the same. And then she's walking out and she says, catch this and blows him a kiss. Mm-hmm. Which he catches. And the the look on James Conn's face when he catches the blown yeah. kiss after everything that's happened is amazing. I think this is a subtly brilliant move by her. She wants to see how active and spry he is. She wants to see how he's progressing. So this ca- kissing and whatever, and him catching it, she has a better idea as a nurse of his physical abilities mm. as he's recovering from the injury. So this is kind of a throwaway moment, but I also think, you know how actors will write books about backstory about their characters? I think this is a bit of brilliance from Rob Reiner and Kathy Bates, where they kind of put this in, and Goldman maybe as well. Um, and they use this moment as a moment for Annie to better assess where Paul is physically so she can adjust her behavior or the dosage or whatever going forward with him. How quickly, how spry he grabs that thing. So because you mentioned it and I actually have William Goldman's script here. Oh yeah. uh, I I made me curious. So this is what it says in the script. Uh, It says, catch this. And she throws him a kiss. It's grotesque. And then it says, cut to Paul summoning up all his courage as he mimes catching it and forces a smile on. She waves and closes the door. Hold on, Paul. The smile dies. He reaches in and pulls the two novel capsules out of his mouth. Yeah. So it's in there, man. That's in the script. Yeah. 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 So I think the blowing the kiss is just, it's also just one more piece of sadism. Yeah, true. You know, it's, I'm going to force you to, 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 I'm going to act happy and force you to be nice to me. Yeah. We cut to the helicopter again and we spot the car. And we cut to J.T. Walsh, who's like, you know, playing a state trooper or something and basically giving a press conference saying (laughs) Paul Sheldon's dead. Yeah. After the press conference, there is Virginia and Buster, and he is touching the door where Annie Wilkes pried the car door open with a crowbar. You don't think he's dead, do you? Well, he might well be, but not the way they say. He never crawled out of that car by himself. You see the dents on the door there. Someone pulled him out. Now we're back to Paul. He's taken a piece of note paper from the notepad, folded it into an envelope, and he is emptying his capsules into the notepad. Hmm. And then he has to figure out what to do with the capsules, the empty capsules, and he eats them. <laughs> um, <laughs> cut to, this is one of my favorite blank page writer's block sort of moments. He's sitting <laughs> at that typewriter. He thinks, he looks, his fingers go down. And he types something really fast, and we see what he typed was, fuck, 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 fuck. <laughs> <laughs> and then he types something, and it's later, and she comes in and says, I'm sorry, Paul, this is all wrong. What I love about this is it is so, having been a writer where you're getting <laughs> notes, <laughs> this is exactly how you feel, <laughs> despite the fact that he's being held captive by a serial killer, you know? Yeah, yeah. Because he says, and this is how you talk to your agent or your editor or your, you know, boss. I really value your criticism, but maybe we're being a little hasty here. Paul, what you've written just isn't fair. And then we get this monologue, which is, again, amazing. Yeah. When I was growing up in Bakersfield, my favorite thing in all the world was to go to the movies on Saturday afternoons for the chapter plays. Cliffhangers. I know that, Mr. Man. They also call them serials. I'm not stupid, you know. <laughs> See this, and that was the explosion about the paper as well. This feeling of like, she's, uh, how can I say this? She's not accomplished in life. She wants to be 
appreciated for her abilities or her skill at whatever she is, and she's not. So this explosion of Paul about the paper, this explosion here when Paul corrects her about it, it's a super frustrating moment because it, it, it implies that in her mind that she's dumb. And that's a massive crime for her in her mind. So to explode at Paul in this moment and be like, I know that. I'm not stupid. That's that. Yeah. It's trying to reclaim some kind of power in the situation. And so what she says is that in the chapter play, it's like a guy gets trapped in a car and there's no way to get out and there's no brakes. They push him off a cliff and it bur- car bursts into flames. And that's the end of the cliffhanger. And the next week, you better believe I was first in line. And they always start with the end of the last week. And there was Rocket Man trying to get out. And here comes the cliff. And just before the car went off the cliff, he jumped free and all the kids cheered. But I didn't cheer. I stood right up and started shouting. Yeah, I love everything Kathy Bates does, but particularly mm-hmm. her doing the voice that she did as a kid. This isn't what happened last week. Have you all got amnesia? They just cheated us. This isn't fair. And the camera is pushing in on her just totally crazed face. And she goes, He didn't get out of the cock a duty car. <laughs> Both Rob Reiner and William Goldman made a point of saying, she is absolutely right. She's insane and crazy, yeah. mm-hmm. but this is bad writing. And this is when Rob felt bad about the phone and saying, hey, that wasn't really fair. That's he didn't get out of the cock duty car. Is that the mo- a good movie shouldn't cheat the audience. Yeah. By the way, one thing that occurred to me uh, only since our last conversation, yeah. you know, we just had that scene where they're looking at where Annie crowbarred the car door open. Oh, and yeah, I suddenly yeah. went, oh, shit. Paul didn't get out of the cock duty car. <laughs> You're right. He was dragged out. Good boy. And, and the other thing that I thought about is that this is all a movie about, or a book about a famous writer who gets in a terrible car accident where his legs are really fucked up. That's what's going to happen to Stephen King about 10 years after this movie. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, that's right. He gets hit by a van. Yeah. By the way, there's some very interesting if you read the Dark Tower series, there's some interesting stuff about that fan. <laughs> um, he also talks about it in the on writing, the, the incredible, his incredible book on writing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Definitely well worth reading. They always cheated like that in um, chapter plays. But not you. Not with my misery. And then she gives him the reason from the previous book, like what she said actually doesn't make sense. Yeah. And she exits and he kind of shakes his head. And I, I literally wrote like, there's this weird way this is fucking funny, you know? I mean, sick and horrible, but like as a writer, like you're still dealing with notes is just funny. King always throws in a little bit of co- dark comedy in his stuff. Um, he's watching her read. Uh, have you ever, I know when you were writing like articles for Collider, did you have to mm. sit in the room and watch someone read your stuff no. while you were there? No, God. Oh, no. It's, it's the worst. It's the God. worst. Uh, because you can't stare at them because that's rude. Yeah. And so you try to find ways to amuse yourself. But all you can think about is what page are they on? They get to the they get to the thing where I said that that you know. Just send me the notes. Just send me the notes. I I couldn't watch someone read my shit. That would drive me insane. Is it fair? Should I continue? You better. And she is enraptured with yeah. what he wrote. Uh, by the way, in the book Misery, he writes a lot more. You read a lot more of Misery. There's Ooh. there's like you know whole sections where you're reading what Paul's written. That makes sense. That's a good counterbalance to yeah. break the tension. Yep. Will she be your old self now that Ian has dug her out, or will she have amnesia? I have to wait. Will she still love him with that special, perfect love? You'll have to wait. Not even a hint? She's clearly a, a person who suffered arrested development along the way. Yes. Right? Where? Have you ever thought about where that was? So, I mean, because clearly, and I say this, she was an unstable person if she was standing up, yelling at the screen, even as a young girl. Um, and looking around, I almost see a girl with like a, uh, obviously she's probably a heavy set young girl with the hair kind of not fully, you know, combed or whatever. Cause her mom probably couldn't care to comb it. And she's trying to stand up. But once again, that moment when she's standing up to yell at everybody, she's trying to say, I'm intelligent. I'm yeah. smarter than you. Um, you can't pull well, And me. there's right and wrong. This and is there's right and wrong. Morally yes, exactly. wrong. So, do you think that maybe there, I don't know if this is in the book because I haven't read the book in so long, but was there a moment where she was sexually abused at some age 
or something like that, or something horrible happened to her because of bullies at school or whatever, because she's caught in that mixture of um, nerd rage and then romanticism. And it doesn't make sense. Those two things don't go together in the same package. So I wonder what that, you know, when that happened to her, because these are such, when you're looking at 2022 eyes, there's so, so many signs here to explore rather than just writing her off as crazy. There's so much more to explore here with her. So a, I actually think that nerd rage and romanticism do go along because I don't think you get to nerd rage unless you really, really love the thing that you love. Unless it's really special to you. You don't think so? No, I don't think so. No. Because romanticism in its pure form is about believing in the power of love and its effect on you. But you cannot believe in the power of love if the other side of you wants to set everything on fire that doesn't, that uh, threatens that. That's the, those two cannot work together. No, I, I yeah, we're, we're, That's what we're using... Getting. Yeah, we're we're using different romantic to be it's a different term. You're for the way you said it for that definition, you I totally agree with you. Yeah. What I'm saying is like the uh romanticizing this oh, thing yes. that you love right. that you've made it so central to yes. you and so important to you that when it doesn't, you know, yeah. So so wonderfully we're both right. Isn't that fantastic? Yes, exactly. Well, and the other thing I'll say is I don't remember anything specifically from the book, but I do know that Kathy Bates and Rob Reiner had long conversations and they did think they did make the decision that she had been abused as a child. Oh yeah. And that's, okay. that's where that, that came makes from. Sense. That absolutely makes sense for the way she plays it. Her miseries alive dance and spinning around is adorable. Yeah. 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 If it wasn't so fucking terrifying. I don't think so. Yeah. Cause I was going to say it does. It doesn't read adorable to me. It reads really unsettling and terrifying. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> I'm going to put on my Liberace records. There's a great symbolism in Liberace, isn't there? A guy who hid his homosexuality that was so obvious now in retrospect, but back then um, people didn't want to believe. He fought against it. You know, he made it very clear he wasn't, even though he was, and clearly was having relationships and all of that. He never, I think, I don't think, I don't think he ever admitted it while he was not alive. Not publicly, no. Yeah, not publicly. So just like Annie there's hiding this other personality behind this character of hers. Um, uh, I, I think I've said this at some point before on the show, but uh, it's worth saying again, is that in the fifties Liberace got way more unsolicited marriage proposals than Elvis. Yes. Believe that. You do like Liberace, don't you? Whenever we played radio city, who do you think was right there in the front row? Was he in the front row for Liberace? No, of course not. Not Paul. But he's found this new tactic he's going to use. Yeah. And then, again, this is all part of Paul's stat- strategy, is he asks her to celebrate Misery's return by having dinner with him. Yeah. Oh, Paul. It would be an honor. We're back with Virginia and Buster. Uh, you know, I won't go into the details of the scene, but he's come in with a whole bunch of Misery books because she wants to find out what Paul Sheldon wrote about. What do you expect to find? A story about a guy who drove his car off a cliff in a snowstorm? You see, it's just that kind of sarcasm that's given our marriage real spice. <laughs> I love them. Yeah, they're a great couple. She's dressed up. We're sitting down to dinner. He's complimenting her on her meatloaf, um, which she put spam in. Um, and Secret ingredient, yeah. Pours her a very big glass of wine. Let's do this right. Do you have any candles? So she goes off to get candles. And when she's gone, he pulls out that little pouch he's obviously been working on for a while. Yeah. Mixes it up in her wine, puts it back down, and she comes back in. To Misery and to Annie Wilkes, who brought her back to life. And they clink glasses, and then she hits the candle. And in reaching for the candle, she spills her glass of wine. Oh! Oh, my God, what have I done? And the cut to... James Kahn's face. The other deflating look on his face is incredible. He has spent days, hours, minutes that probably felt like hours, seconds that felt like minutes, planning this whole thing out and didn't factor in her awkwardness or clumsiness or any of that. 
and it all comes to bear here. It comes crashing down. It's a great, great moment. Well, two, two things about this. So the first one is, and it's not just that, he's toughing out his pain. Because yes, he's not taking right. his pain meds. Good point. You know, and in the book, it's clear that he's an, an addict, so it's really tough. But this was actually the question that occurred to me, and you kind of already answered it, is when you you said before about the penguin that, oh, she's obviously knows and she's many steps ahead of him all the time, is I suddenly went, wait, holy shit, is John saying that she knocked over that glass on purpose because she knew he was drug, trying to drug her? 100%. So it wasn't just her being awkward. Do you, th- she's not stupid like she said, like she's worried that everyone thinks she is. She's not. She is smart at this. She is smart at this. And I think if she's been drugging babies and fooling parents and fooling judges and lawyers, do you think Paul Sheldon is a match for her? No. And I, and I think she knew. When he when she sent when he sent her out to get paper, I think she knew what he was going to try to do, and we don't see her checking the house. We're all it's right. all left to our imagination. Yeah. So she could have very well checked the house and all of that jazz and seen the penguin and was like, "Oh well, he got out. Let's see if I let's see what he does." And then been aware of him not taking because if you think she's aware of how he's reacting by not taking the pills, like she's a nurse, her job is to monitor the person and how they're reacting to the medication and to the things your drugs you are giving them. So she's just logging all that in her mind. I think Paul overplays his moment by thinking she's stupid by inviting her to dinner and all of that. He thinks he's smarter than her in a way. You look at this film as a bit of misogyny because Mm -hmm. he is a man thinks he's smarter than her in this situation. And yes, she's unstable and whatever, but he thinks, Oh, this is just a crazy woman. I know how to deal with crazy women. I'm going to do this and this and this and trick her into this and this and this. Right? But she's much more smarter than he is. And she's aware of everything. And I think she knows. He probably, I think she knows. That's why she steps out. I think she does all that stuff. The second he asks her to dinner, I think she knows that he is trying to play her. And so this whole thing is a charade. But she's going to go with it because fuck it. What else is she going to do? Watch Love Connection? She's going to have this fun with Paul Sheldon and her saying, oh, if you, I said, which leg are you going to pull me? This whole aw shucks game she's playing, it's all lies. It's all lies. Um, and so in that moment, I think she absolutely knocks this over just to see how he might react. So first of all, I, in my mind, it was always an accident. And so I actually think it's way better in your version of it is way better. I'm curious how many people watching thought it was an accident and how many people watching thought it was one more way that she was torturing him. Yeah. I was going to say, it goes along with what you said earlier, Steve, she's a sadist. Oh yeah. So what's even more satisfying for a sadist than giving you hope that you can get out of the situation, that you're smarter than they are. There's nothing more satisfying than closing the door on that right in your face to, to deflate you even more and to make you even more dependent on them. You know, it's classic. No, I, I, I've totally shifted to your perspective <laughs> because it's a better movie. Right. You know what yes. I mean? Yes. Like your version is a better movie than my version the movie that was in my head. And I already thought my movie was great. So <laughs> what is the final moment? They lift up their glasses and she says to misery, to misery. Which has a double meaning now. Because she's toasting double. his misery. Yeah, yeah, at least double. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, more. right. Good point. At least double. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then we cut to an absolutely stunningly put together montage of Paul writing. And mm-hmm. this is Barry Sonnenfeld and Rob Reiner looking really closely together. And I highly recommend you watch this montage and try to figure out how they did it. Because mm-hmm. what I think they basically did is they put... James, because it's basically going to cover a long period of time where he's writing and we're going to go from chapter one to chapter five to chapter 35 to almost finishing the book. We're going to see James Conn get healthier and his legs get stronger. They get lowered down. We're going to see time pass and we're going to see him in different outfits as he's doing all this. And so Uh what I think they did was they said, okay, this is a weekend and they set up his injuries and his clothes for that. And they did. Uh, a tracking shot. They did a push in, they did a close up. They did a whole bunch of different shots mm-hmm. in one set of lighting. 
And then they changed his clothes and they did the whole thing again in a different set of lighting. And then they changed his clothes and did the whole thing again. And it's probably James Conn city. That's probably two or three days is my oh, guess. Right. Right. It's a lot to do all this. Yeah. yeah and yeah. it just pass after pass after pass. And then it's a lot of time editing it together because you'll see there's these dissolves during it. It's mm -hmm. really, really interesting. This was complicated. It took a long time to figure out. Yeah. And the other thing it's, uh, it's, you know, later on, and we see him lifting up that typewriter, doing presses, yes. trying to get stronger. Yeah. And then there's this shot of her looking out the window at the rain, and her, she just looks, it's that dead emptiness from Annie. It's, she's in that place. That's what was really scary, yeah. When you first came here, I only loved the writer part of Paul Sheldon. But now I know I love the rest of him, too. Man, love is scary when someone speaks about it like this. I know you don't love me. Don't say you do. And I love this line. I think it's a great line. I think she's great the way that she says it. You're beautiful, brilliant, famous man of the world, and I'm not a movie star type. <laughs> this is her inner insecurity coming out in a in a weird way. It's so unsettling because even when she's being vulnerable, she's scared. She's even more scary when she's vulnerable. Because oh, yeah. You see all the emotions that are gone. Mm -hmm. So you see the Annie that's like, that's really inside behind all the acts and all the explosions of anger. There's this real like hatred of herself that's lingering there um, behind all the walls. And it's scary. Well, and this next line is a line that my guess on some level, most people have felt not the psychopathic killer part of it, mm. but something like this on some level, yeah. which is where she says, You'll never know the fear of losing someone like you if you're someone like me. Because most people have probably been in love with someone that wasn't into them or, you yeah. know, had a relationship falling apart when they didn't want to fall apart. And it throws you into this insecure, sad, lonely, mm -hmm. you know, place. Yeah. And she is in a terrible version of that. Yeah. And, and, you know, we talked about lying before and Paul's going to try to lie to her now. And what I love is that it's, it's really clear that he's lying. Yep. Why would I leave? I like it here. That's very kind of you, but I'll bet it's not altogether true. And then she looks down, she reaches into her pocket and she pulls out a gun. I have this gun. And she dry fires it. Sometimes I think about using it. <laughs> it's so fucking scary. <laughs> yeah, it is. I better go now. I might put bullets in it. Dude. <laughs> I think it's great. Like, she's being vulnerable. She's being honest in that moment. So much so, because she's so in control that she can do this. You know what I'm saying? She's so aware of it. And I think that's what's so great to see is that she's aware of how much power she has in the situation. So she is going to mess with him a like a little bit, just, just pulling the gun out, just showing the gun is enough. You know, what occurred to me as I was watching it this time around, what if that whole thing is an act to give him hope? The whole thing where she's, Oh, you're going to leave me and you're going to do this and you're going to do that. And, and he, and I think once again, Paul misplays the situation. Paul, acting as if he's going to be all about her and shit. She's very clear that he's not no, going to be all about her. So the better play is to be like, yeah, I, I want to see my daughter and I want to see this so that there's a little bit of believability you can play with here with her. So you can have a better angle or better, um, uh, what do you call it? Better negotiating situation. But to play it the way he does to kind of buy into her stupidity, buy her into her um, uh, obsession with him is uh, stupid. I don't know. I think in that moment she's figuring out how to fuck with him even more. You know what this is all making me realize is just how fucking unknowable Annie Wilkes is. Yes. Because your interpretation is consistently that she's more in control than mine is. Like mm. my interpretation 
Like, it's totally possible that she's doing all of this on purpose and pulling out this gun at this moment purposely to scare the shit out of him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's also possible that she's really, really just fucking depressed and not thinking about what she's doing. You Listen, know, I've been in a lot of shitty relationships. And the thing is, and every single time, and listen, and I, sometimes I've been the shitty one in the relationship. Let's be real. I don't want to play myself as some kind of fucking angel. But people who are not, how can I say this? People who are not emotionally sound or people who have not done the work to find out where they exist better will do certain things in relationships or whatever and then and uh, explain it away or rationalize it even though they know better right? Even though they know they shouldn't. And it's all the process. And I think that's a uh, part of it. You know, people can say, oh, I didn't know I was doing that. I didn't know I was. A-. No, you knew. You just didn't want to let yourself think that you were doing that. And I think that's a part of it. Uh, I think we're much more aware of what we're doing in our relationships, if we could be honest with ourselves, than we think we are. We're just maybe don't have the emotional vocabulary to understand how aware we are. But I think in retrospect, we if we're being honest with ourselves, like I say, that 3 a.m. moment when no one else is around and we're looking at ourselves in the mirror, we're much more we're much more aware of what we're doing than we think we are. We just don't want to believe we're selfish individuals when really most human beings are to survive. You know? it, it's so funny because, of course, the, that I think mostly the opposite. I think people bump around into each other, not really aware of what they're doing most of the time until that 3 a.m moment moment you know yeah, yeah. and then and then they frequently will maybe have that moment of like oh shit i guess i do that thing and then promptly fucking forget it yeah and go back to doing that fucking thing again you know either way uh, the results either my way or your way the results are the same yeah. <laughs> yeah. i mean you know i i there was a, i had a situation where i had sort of a long-term conflict with someone mm. and had explained myself really clearly about this thing that this person did Oh yeah, and I finally had to go like, oh, they're never going to hear me. Like they're no. that's just they, right. they're not capable of hearing this thing that I'm trying to say. Yeah. So she's gone. Yeah. <laughs> she drive. He hears her drive away, and he makes it to the kitchen and pulls that knife. Mm. And then we cut to uh, our sheriff in bed reading, and he reads this line out of a misery novel. There is a justice higher than that of man. I will be judged by him. And he writes down that quote. That's going to come back later. God love this sheriff doing all this research to find out only to get shot with a fucking shotgun in the back. It's so fucking horrible. <laughs> I mean, I'm just, it's just the worst moment. Um, so, and then as he's rolling back through her living room, he sees this, her scrapbook. Yeah. And he sees, first of all, a newspaper article that says Paul Sheldon presumed dead. Hmm. And then he starts going through this scrapbook and he sees things like her husband, Carl Wilkes, banker, plunged to his death. Nursing student falls to their death. And Annie Wilkes is heading to intensive care and maternity. And then a pediatrician dies. And then a baby dies. And another baby dies. And the nurses questions. And there are more baby deaths. And then it says, dragon lady arrested in recent nursery deaths. Mm. So somehow she got away with this, though. Yeah. Do you have any, do we have any guess on how many people Annie Wilkes actually killed? Oh, I don't know if I could, uh, 10? It's, it's 10, 10 at least, it seems like, at well, least. I mean, we see the nursing person that was going to get the awards, and then she mysteriously fell off a cliff, and so Annie got the awards. Then there's all those babies. I think she yeah. might have killed her parents or her grandparents. No, it's, yeah, that's a yeah. lot. It's a lot of people. And then he's lying in bed, and he's practicing pulling that knife out of his sling. And by the way, every time he pulls the knife out, the knife makes that sound. Yeah. yeah. Knives don't make that sound. They don't make that sound. Particularly when you're pulling them out of a cloth sling. Yeah, only you know? cartoons. Yeah. <laughs> but it works and it's good. Yeah. And then that moment of like, he hears her car coming back. There's thunder. He hears the footsteps. He's ready with the knife. He sees the feet go by the light of, uh, you know, underneath the door. Yeah. He's ready to kill her. He's looking at the knob. The knob doesn't turn, and she walks away. Yeah. And now he's just sitting there trying to figure out what to do. Yeah. And finally, he slips that big knife between the mattresses and says, See you in the morning. There's this moment, again, it's like this moment of hope, like this moment, like, 
okay, he's going to fight back. And then we cut to him fucking asleep. And I love the way they shoot this is she's there. Yeah. The lightning hits her face flashes and she just fucking charges him and injects him with something before he can do anything. Yep. I think she was standing there for hours waiting him to, for him to wake up. I think she wanted him to see him, her drug him again, sadism. And now we've arrived at the scene. <laughs> So, by the way, uh, th- this scene is why William Goldman decided to make the movie. Good. And in his script, she cuts his foot off, which is what with an axe, which is what right. happens in the book. Right. And as I think I mentioned, George Roy Hill, who was supposed to be the director, he finally said, I can't make this movie because of cutting the foot off. <laughs> and then William Goldman goes away on vacation and Rob Reiner takes the script away and rewrites it and make, turns it into the hobbling scene with breaking the ankle rather than cutting the foot off. Right. Goldman comes back from his vacation. Now, they're buddies. They did the Princess Bride together. They know right. each other a long time. Right, right, right. And he wigs out. He is absolutely furious, is screaming in Rob Reiner's face that he ruined the movie, that this is it's the whole reason he did the movie was for this scene, and he has wow. ruined it. And William Goldman says he went to the first screening of the film and they got to the scene, and he immediately knew he was 100% wrong. <laughs> he said, if we had actually cut the foot off, the audience would have rejected. They would have been out. Yeah. And it's that the way they did it was way more scarier than what he had thought it should be. when he Yes. It. And that's the difference sometimes in those moments of understanding what the overall construction of a movie is. And, of course, when Goldman understands that with a script. Sure. Rob Reiner is the director understood like the way we're building Annie up. If she goes that far out, there's no, there it should become something completely different and unfamiliar. The hobbling is something familiar the way, because she gives historical context, it makes it even more familiar. Do you know what I'm saying? And so I think that's genius. Cutting off the foot almost seems um, how can I say this? Almost seems serial killer brutish, brutalish. Whereas, and then she stops being a fan at that point. She becomes something else. But in this way, she is she is still somehow in some warped way doing this out of love for him to get him to stop running away and focus on writing. So it's crazy. It's insane. And as Jan- as uh, Paul says later in the movie. In some ways, I feel like I owe her. I know it's crazy. Right. So, you know, it, well, this is I think one of those moments. Cutting the foot off is like more like a slasher film. It's more yeah, kind of bloody right. gory. It's so what? Brutal. Yeah, this is like a much weirder thing. Mm-hmm. And it's just, I don't know. I, I think Rob Reiner, that's a genius move. It's sexual. You know, it's sexual. Sexual. I don't know. They can't have that. sex, right? Because she's not going to. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be, she wouldn't rape him because of how, what happened to her. So how can I keep him where he needs to be? How can I make him even more devoted to me? Oh, I'm doing this for you. She even says this, I think I'm doing this for your own good. Oh yeah. And so it's almost in a way sexual, like uh, making it's her way of expressing her love in a physical way towards him. That is just as explosive as a sexual uh, completion, you know, having sex to completion. It's almost like that. She almost looks like she's having a little bit of a sexual turn on from it in the way her face and her reaction to it in between swinging it from the left to the right foot. Um, it's funny you say that there. I'm going to, I'm going to bring up that later on with something that's going to go on in the film. Um, I love, by the way, I think James Conn does a great job of kind of coming to still kind of drugged out Mm -hmm. and slowly realizing that he's been tied down and what's going on. And the first thing she says is about the penguin and that her penguin always faces due south. He tries lamely to deny it. Yes. Yeah. And as he's talking to her, his fingers are reaching between the mattresses to find the knife that he stashed there. Is this what you're looking for? And that same shink knife sound. Last night, it came so clear. I realized you just need more time. Eventually, you'll come to accept the idea of being here. And then she says, in this very sort of conversational tone. Paul, do you know about the early days at the Kimberly Diamond Mines? 
you know what they did to the native workers who stole diamonds? And I love that she tries to reassure him as he reacts. Don't worry, they didn't kill them. That would be like junking a Mercedes just because it had a broken spring. No, if they caught them, they had to make sure they could go on working, but they also had to make sure they could never run away. The operation was called hobbling. And the thing is, this was in the trailer. It was in the yeah. commercials. Yeah. But you never knew what it actually was. Right. And because and then you're watching, and the moment where she puts this huge, like, you know, four by four or whatever it is between his ankles, mm. and you're like, what the fuck is about to happen? That's absolutely right. What the fuck is about to happen is yeah. what you're thinking in your mind. Yeah. Danny. Whatever you think I'm not doing, please don't do it. There, there in that moment, Steve, is Paul Sheldon realizing you are a fucking idiot. She was ahead of you the whole time. She knew where you put your pills. She knew you had the knife under there. And I don't know, he slept. She might have drugged him. Maybe she monitored her sleeping patterns. Maybe she was aware of how tired he was or aware of how, how much of a deep sleeper he was. But she went in there at the right time, took everything out, waited for him to wake up, drugged him. And then when he came to, so that she could like, you know, strap him down and everything. And then when he came to, him realizing piece by piece that oh, yeah. she took away all his weapons, all his ability to fight back. And there is Paul Sheldon begging for his life in essence yeah. in front of Annie. And that's why I think it's sexual. She, she has him so vulnerable. And she takes him, so to speak. Yeah. Well, and and just the him begging and pleading and mm. her saying, trust me, and being so sort of calm. She knows exactly what she's doing. Yeah. And this might be mirroring what happened to her when she was raped by maybe an uncle or her own father or an older brother or a cousin. Sure. Where she's the one lying on the bed, prostrate, maybe even tied to the bed. And the person is confidently walking back and forth, no, saying, it's going to be fine. I'm doing this for your own good. You're going to enjoy this. It's for, for it's for the best. That kind of thing. So in a way, she's almost reliving her trauma, but she's the one in control. I love the way she sort of steps out of frame, mm. very calm, mm. lifts up that big sledgehammer. <sighs> and this is, by the way, it's a you know, it's a prosthetic, and they built it in the special effects department. I don't give a shit. It looks so real. It, it was funny. I heard a Kathy Bates <sighs> interview where she yeah. was just like, "This wasn't." She was really just thinking technically about not messing it up. Right, of course, because you're swinging something like that, yeah. Yeah, and I, I just, you know, I mentioned before, I wonder how many frames it is. Well, as we've been talking, I managed to count it. The whole shot is 19 frames. Wow. The sh And, it, you know, it's 24 frames a second, so it's just under a second for the whole shot. From the moment she hits the foot to the cut is six frames. So it's, an, it's only on screen for a, a fourth of a quarter of a second. Um, and it is so... Fucking horrible. Yeah, man. It's for the best. Hey, please! <laughs> Almost done. Just one more. Oh, just the, the angle that it goes to. And I'm a guy who has, I've twisted my ankle three or four times playing basketball. Like, bad. That, yeah. Yeah, so, and I'm sure you've done it in yep. uh, martial arts. It is Volley most, volleyball once I had a oh, volleyball. Oh. Yeah. Even now as we're talking about it right now, I'm getting like the re reliving the feeling of it all because it absolutely goes up my hamstrings to my balls. Like it's that kind of tingling sensation of like things falling out from underneath you. And that's what it feels like. Those ankle injuries were so horrific for me. Like the screams and the yelps that I would yell out um, when it happened were just the, cause there's always unexpected and it's just fucking brutal, man. And it makes you feel light down there, like going over, like in a roller coaster, going over a huge mountain and uh, roller coaster. That's what it feels like. It feels like your balls completely drop out from underneath you, man. At the, and so every time I watch that scene, it just fucking decimates me like that. Well, and let's add this to it. So you just sprained your ankle playing basketball, mm. and then someone says, "Now, almost done. Just <laughs> one more. Just one more." No! Yeah, exactly. and he's writhing and oh. screaming. And His she, scream is so good. So yeah, good. and she hits the other one, and then as he's lying there, literally quivering in bed, she says, "God, I love you." See, sexual. 
Oh yeah. No, I agree with you. I a hundred percent agree. The God I love you is her being done with her satisfying herself. So oof, it's such a perfect scene. So and, and Rob, you don't need to show it. You don't need to belabor the point or stay on it for 25 frames or whatever you say. Yeah. Four frames, six frames. That's enough. Oof. Well, I think if you had stayed on it longer, it would be less scary. It's cause it's only there for a second. Yeah. It could become comical. Right. Yeah. Um, by the way, Rob Reiner hates violence. This was a really hard scene for him to do. <laughs> he just doesn't like, and you think about his movies, he doesn't make violent movies. Oh, no, he does. Yeah. Um, it is ranked as the number 12 scariest movie moment of all time. Fuck that. It's number one, number five, top five, at least. What? what? There are 11 scarier moments than that? that can't it's, a, it's a good question. Well, uh, I can think of a couple. Chrissy going swimming, I think, is scarier. Okay. <laughs> uh, by the way, as we said before, the book is way more brutal. Because she also cuts his thumb off. She, I mean, there's just way more. Oh, my God. Yeah. Um, and then we cut to her pulling into town. We're watching from the sheriff's office. We hear a little screech of tires, and we hear... And he looks out the window, and I think this is the first moment he thinks starts to think about Annie Wilkes. Yeah. And he's looking through his paperwork and arguing with Virginia, and he finds a piece of paper. He's in the library, and he's looking through, you know, those big books that have newspapers in them mm. and finds articles about Annie Wilkes on trial. And guess what she says in the quote from the trial? There is a justice higher than that of man. I will be judged by him. And he yeah. checks the quote, and it is, of course, the misery quote. Where have you heard people quoting that quote saying, you know, only God can judge me, which is yeah. ridiculous. Yeah, particularly if you're an atheist. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, even more so. I, I absolutely love the moment where she's like back home, looks at, in the, uh, it th looks at him in the window and says, Hi, pumpkin! He flips her off. <laughs> that is great. <laughs> well, because she's also broken down all his bullshit. So now yeah. he feels free enough to flick her off. Cause fuck it. It's all done now. Yeah. No. What the fuck? Yeah. I mean, there's no, yeah, exactly. yeah. Um, Buster goes into the general store and asks about Paul Sheldon books, asks if Annie Wilkes bought one. And then he asks, has she been uh, buying anything odd lately? Ms. Wilkes. Same old stuff. Lest you call paper on newspaper. No, Typing kind. Well, that kind. Nothing odd about that. So he's not sharing with anyone what his suspicions are. Yeah. I, I really am mad at Buster. <laughs> <laughs> like, I love him so much. And from this point forward, I'm like, and, and it's not a criticism of the movie because I am so fucking upset that obviously the movie is working really well on me. But what happens next is, t oh, it's, it's so awful. Uh, in the book... It's just random police. A random police officer shows up and, and he kills him. Yeah. You're, there's no detective side of it because you're never cutting away from the house. And so the whole thing with the quote and all that stuff is stuff they had to add in order to give a full detective story of how Buster comes up with going to Annie Wilkes's house. Yeah. So he drives up to the house and we're looking out the window and Paul sees it. And just as he's reacting to the sheriff showing up, Man, she charges in, and it, he's trying to fight her off, and she gives her a shot, and it just, and then he kind of fades out. I don't think I'll ever understand you. I cook your meals, I tend to you practically 24 hours a day, and you continue to fight me. When are we going to develop a sense of trust? <laughs> John, when are we going to develop a sense of trust? Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> what more do you want? I've hobbled you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, come on. I've drugged you up. <laughs> How much more can I do? So she dumps him down in the basement, and then we have this moment where she opens the door just as he's knocking, and man, Annie does a great bunch of bullshit here, I think. Yeah. Well, I was wondering, do you happen to know anything about Paul Sheldon? Well, he was born in Worcester, Massachusetts, 45 years ago, the only child of Franklin and Helene Sheldon, mediocre student, majored in history. Well, that, that isn't exactly the kind of information I'm after. You see, he's been missing for quite some time now and i, I we know were... it's so upsetting i'm his number one fan because annie knows that if she said paul who's paul sheldon that he would know she was lying right and then she even says starts talking about the accident and that god told her that she had to be the replacement which explains why she has the typewriter in the paper again pretty good lies yeah 
Must get lonely living out here all by yourself. Well, I always say if you can't enjoy your own company, you're not fit company for anyone else. Look how easy she slides into this fake persona. The same persona, fake persona she's been using with Ball at times. So this is just a defense. Me- this is a, you know, whatever you call it. It's, it's a lie she willingly does in order to keep people away from her believing that she's this killer, you know? So it's so funny. And this is the variation of how you and I see it is like, I don't see it as a fake persona. I see it as a aspect of her or her or who the kind of person she wants to be. I think she totally believes if you're not, don't like your own company, then you're not fit company for anybody else. I think she believes that. Okay. I think she loves her pig misery. I think she loves Liberace. I think all that's true. I think she'd kill her pig in a heartbeat if she had no other food. Oh, no way. I think she would kill 20 people if they were mean to her. <laughs> oh, fair enough. Fair enough. Maybe. Um, okay. But it is, it's so interesting how uh, I go back to like, man, I think Annie Wilkes is really, truly unknowable hmm. on some levels. I really like the shot where they're peeking out at each other down the hallway. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's my question, though. Is Buster buying this? No, not at all. I think Buster is very clear, especially because he goes upstairs. I think Buster, no, he's just trying to find that thing because he's, he's an officer of the law. He has to find that little bit of evidence that allows him to do to go to the next step. But he has to find it. And so... The, the looking back in on each other, that is such a dead fucking giveaway for both of them. She knows he's onto her and he knows she's onto him, but they have to play this thing out. Uh, so, and so they understand the situation because she, he's not the first detective or police person who's been in her presence or in her house in her life. So she knows how to play this. So does she, he, does he think that she ha- grabbed Paul Sheldon? Yes. He just needs to find the evidence so that he can go to the next step with it. Well, this is, and this is what bothers me or upsets me so much is that I, that makes sense to me too. That's what I think too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But then why is he constantly walking in front of her? Why is he not, he is so not careful around a person who, as far as he know, kidnapped a person and maybe murdered them. It's like he is, he is not giving her the respect of someone who's dangerous. Are you telling me? That a man is not giving a woman the respect in 1990 that she could possibly attack him from behind? Is that what you're telling me? Yes. That this is a surprise? You know? Yes. Yeah. Because I've respected Buster so much throughout this whole movie. Yeah, but he's also bashed his wife the whole time throughout the movie. (laughs) Right? He's bashed his wife for trying to clean up his stuff. The sarcasm comment. He's made a number of comments at her. He, she's the one more turned on about having sex with him than he is. She, she, he is. But isn't that all that, loving? Do you find that really mean? No, or is it, it is. He, sure, it's loving, but it also it also can have a foundation in feeling like he's an old school man, and so he runs things, and ain't no woman gonna get the drop on him. I'm not trying to make Buster a bad person. I'm just saying you can have soft misogyny, and that's a little bit like you have soft racism. This term they like to throw around nowadays soft misogyny here as well or unconscious misogyny the way he walks in front of her and he also has this feeling i'm a person of the law so there's this belief that you have this extra level of protection which we've seen people use in situations where normally they wouldn't put themselves in these kind of dangerous moments but because there's something that happens of wearing the uniform wearing the badge they feel that there's almost this kind of shield that goes on them uh, that people won't do certain things to them because they are representative of the law. Well, and I think there's also the, he's a small town sheriff and how often has he really actually had to deal with a truly violent situation? Maybe that's could be part of it as well. Maybe not his backstory. And just because yes. it doesn't mean he didn't come from another town that where there was a lot of this shit. So he's retiring to a small town. So he doesn't deal with the shit. Could be. Yeah. But so he goes upstairs. It's all really scary. And I really wonder, do you think that you thought about Martin Balsam in Psycho the first yeah. time you saw this movie? A hundred percent. Yeah. Because I bet I did too. Because I'm just the the fact that it's a staircase, the fact that the person yeah. is that close to exposing what's really going on. And then the shock of the moment, just like the shock of Anthony Perkins running out from the yep. the God's eye view running out from the room. And and it's just and I and I this time watching it, I was pretty sure that he died, but I couldn't remember for certain when I, cause I hadn't seen the movie in a while. And I really wanted to believe as they were saying goodbye 
you know, cause she sneaks up on him upstairs and then they finish up and then, you know, he says, Hey, maybe I'll come back another time. And she says, that's great. Now that you know the way and he's leaving. And I'm like, maybe he'll live. <laughs> <laughs> and you'd see Paul Sheldon slowly waking up down in the basement yeah. and starting to move around. And then he's goes out the front door and then we hear a noise. Miss Wilkes, are you all right? Here, I'm down here. And he opens up the door to the stair down to the basement. It happens so fast. Mr. Sheldon? Oh, it's so upsetting. Double barrel shotgun. You see, I've known for some time why I was chosen to save you. You and I were meant to be together forever. Now our time in this world must end. But don't worry, Paul. I've prepared for what must be done. I put two bullets in my gun. One for you and one for me. <laughs> and she comes back with the revolver and the syringe. Now don't be afraid. I love you. And what does Paul say back to her? I love you too. This is where I go. I don't think she's 100%. He is, he does sell her on this bullshit, mm -hmm. you know, like she does want to believe that he could love her. You know, She was never going to kill herself. I hope you know that. No, of course she, she was going to kill herself. Nope. She was going to kill him. She was never going to kill herself. Oh, I that's what I think. Kill I, again, totally. Yeah. That's totally motivatable. <laughs> very possible. Yeah. Right. Cause um, in, in her fucked up way, she does love herself or thinks she's, she's, because she might even go like, oh, are you telling me not to kill myself now? We are meant to be together. And I know we must die. But it must be so that misery can live. It's such a good plan. At the, I mean, and he's, and he's he spotted the lighter fluid. And he's coming up with this very much on the spot. And he's basically saying, the book's almost done. By dawn, I'll finish it. And we give misery back to the world. And then we can die. Yeah. And he's upstairs and he's typing and she's excited and asking questions and he's finishing. When I finish, I'd like everything to be perfect. I'll need three things. What things? You don't know. And of course she does know mm -hmm. cigarette because you used to smoke and, and, and you need one glass of champagne. Dom Perignon. <laughs> Oh, Paul, this is so romantic. Ian and Winthorn dueling for the right to Misery's hand. Does Ian win? Odo, tell me. It's Winthorn, right? You'll know everything in a minute. Get the champagne. Oh. Oh. Do you think her excitement here is fake? No, I think her excitement here is... I think it's 100% real. Excited. Yeah. And she comes back in, and I love it. It almost looks like Wes Anderson style. How perfectly framed the mm. the gun and the and the matches and the cigarette and the champagne are on the tray. You know. Did I do good? You did perfect, except for one thing. And you see her face fall, just like with yeah. the smudge paper. And there's this moment. This time we'll need two glasses. And I think she's a one hundred percent filled with romance and love at this moment. Okay. And as soon as she's gone, he moves, he throws his, the, the whole novel on the floor, twists up the paper, grabs the lighter fluid, pours it on the book, and she enters and sees him. And then I love what he says here. Remember how for all those years nobody knew who Misery's real father was? Or if they'd ever be reunited? It's all right here. Does she finally marry Ian? Or will it be Winthorn? It's all right here. And you're never going to get to see it. This is where I think Paul finally gets the jump on her. This yeah. moment. Because she, I think, I don't think 100% that she's excited uh, uh, that is just about reading the book. I think she's excited because here's what I think Misery is going to do. I, and, oh, sorry, um, Annie's going to do. I think Annie thinks in her warped mind that she's going to kill Paul. And in some way, she's going to make it so that she can continue writing the Misery. Mm. Oh, um, sure. Because she studied him for so long, she and the fact that she look at the look at the look at the whole film, right? She's the one that kidnaps him, and we talked about this. How long has she been planning this? And the moment finally arrived when he had the car accident. She saves him, pulls him in there. 
And now in her mind, what is she? I mean, this is a woman that is constantly thinking about what she's going to do. So she is figuring out slowly but surely how to make this all happen. And clearly, as we see from the scrapbook, she's been able to get herself out of some pretty tricky situations through her mind and her and her and her um, ability to speak her way, talk her way out of these situations. So I think through the whole movie, she's been setting this whole thing up to make him, in essence, so dependent on her so that she can eventually put him in the situation where she's going to assure him that, you know, we're both going to die together and it, you'll, it'll be a legendary thing. Because how else is the book going to get to where it's going to get to if someone doesn't stay great alive? Point. And so that's a great point. Right. So if he's going to kill himself, she's going to talk him into the fact that he's going to she's going to kill him for posterity or whatever. And then in that moment, she's going to be like, boom, I'm going to bury him. Paul left me this letter saying that I should carry on. We've been friends for a long time. I will carry on the legacy of, of Miss. So in, sense, in essence, her fandom co-opting his fame for, for herself so that she can be famous without doing the work. And most unstable fans of people are fans of them because they want to be them, but they don't want to do the work and they don't have the talent. So that right. what's the shortest cut to get there? Somehow finding a way to assume their legacy or take over their legacy and achieving that. That's why a lot of people get mad at like, you know, the the young wives or the young husbands that come in right at the tail end of an older person's life because they think they're just going in to take their legacy and make themselves important rather than actually doing the work themselves to make themselves important, whether it's true or not. That's right. where the anger comes from with people who have been fans of these people for such a long time towards those people that go in and essentially try to co-opt the legacy or take control of the legacy. So I think that's part of, I think it's a lot of what's, what Annie's plans are here. It's a really good point. And, and I do want to point out too, that like these things of the champagne, the matches, the lighter mm. fluid, the book. She had it already. Yeah. Well, and that's literally the first images of the movie is the yes. cigarette and the match and the right. and the paper and then him burning his own book. Like all these things are coming back again and again. I mean, um, they played shotgun at the beginning of the movie. She used a shotgun to kill the sheriff. Exactly. It's all tied together. Paul, you can't. Why not? I learned it from you. And lights the book on fire. And she dives to put out the fire and he lifts up that typewriter and brings it down on her. That moment of her diving down to put out the fire is the m only genuine moment from Annie Wilkes in the movie, in my opinion. The only mm. non-manufactured, honest, authentic mm. moment. Her screeches, her fear, her pain, her shock, her horror, her plans essentially going up in smoke. That is that reaction, which is why she lets her defenses down for Paul to be able to hit her over the head with the typewriter. In every other physical situation, she's been in control. She brum rushes him. She drugs him. She uh, hobbles him. She does all these things. She is constantly controlling any physical interaction with Paul. Even dragging him out of the fucking car, he's in a debilitated state. She's in control. In this moment, she lets her guards down, and that's how Paul can get her with the typewriter. Um, by the way, this is Rob Reiner's sixth film, and there is only one other movie in which he had done a fight scene. <laughs> uh, is, Princess Bride. Right? Princess Bride. Yeah. Uh, it's, he doesn't do a lot of fight scenes. Yeah. Kathy Bates is a pacifist. This whole thing was really emotional for her. Oh, like I this bet. was just hard for her to do. James Caan was thrilled, of course, <laughs> because he finally got to move. Fuck it, um, Con. <laughs> and he was also he's very athletic. And yes, and what, what Kathy Bates said was he made her feel a lot safer and a lot because he was so coordinated and comfortable doing this kind of stuff. Because yeah. and the other interesting thing in this fight scene is you were mentioning things about it being sexual before mm -hmm. they they thought of this as a as a love making scene in a oh. weird way yeah with them on top of each other and you know trading places and all this stuff going on right she charges him I love that throughout this entire movie she said cock a duty and does clearly is not a person who swears and she says I'm gonna tell you you like cocksucker. And the fight is just brutal and nasty and bloody. Uh, she pulls out the gun, shoots him in the shoulder. He's on top of each other face to face. He's banging her head against the floor, grabs burning paper and stuffs it into his mouth. He said, eat it, eat it to yourself, you sick, twisted fuck. You know what? The only 
fight scene that has anything like that for me is I'm going to kill you and then I'm going to cook you and then I'm going to fucking eat you. <laughs> Die hard. Yes. And she falls and hits the corner of the typewriter with her head and she is out. And we're like, oh, she's she's dead. I guess we're fine. Hmm. And he crawls out of the room, dragging himself away and then screaming. She's on top of him again. Yeah. And again, they fight. He finds a pig statue and beats her in the head with it. And then you see her hit her again. And she just goes out and the light goes out in her eyes and she yeah. falls. And that is the end of Annie Wilkes. And we fade out and then we're in New York city and it says 18 months later. And there is Paul wearing a nice suit with a cane and he's walking with a limp yeah. into a fancy restaurant. And uh, there's Lauren Bacall who hands him the first copy of his new book and says, the word I'm getting is the times review is going to be a love letter. That'll be a first. And my contacts at time and Newsweek tell me they're both raves and don't laugh. But for the first time, I think you've got a shot at some prizes. Great. And she's surprised that he's not more excited. Yeah. I'm delighted the critics are liking it, and I hope the people like it too. But I wrote it for me. One of the interesting things in the book is that Paul faked burning the misery, misery novel. Oh. And that is the book that he's publishing because he loves it. Oh, wow. Interesting. I don't think it's as powerful. I agree. Right? I agree. Yeah. Because what it's saying is like you wanted to get away from this thing and now you're just stuck in it, you know? Yeah. Like misery novels instead of, no, you, yeah. you literally destroyed misery, you know? Right. I don't think I'm completely nuts, but in some way, Annie Wilkes, that whole experience uh, helped me. And then she asks him, Basically says, look, I would get thrown out of the editor's guild if I didn't ask you if you wanted to write some nonfiction on what happened to you. Gee, Marsh, if I didn't know you better, I think you were suggesting I dredge up the worst horror of my life just so we could make a few bucks. <laughs> now, which writers do sometimes, yeah. Sure, of course. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure it would sell millions of copies. You yeah, know? I'm sure it would too, yeah. I love the way they do this next moment, which is that he's talking about not getting over this thing. And he's talking to, to Marsha. But he is looking, as we hear really dissonant music, at a server coming into the restaurant, and it is Annie Wilkes. Yeah. And she's coming towards him, and as he's talking, she pulls out a knife. Even though I know she's dead, I still think about her once in a while. And then we cut back to who we thought was Annie Wilkes, and it's not. It's just a, a waitress, and she says, Excuse me, I don't mean to bother you, but are you Paul Sheldon? Yes. <laughs> I just want to tell you I'm your number one fan. And his reaction is not he's like, oh, that's nice. Or something like that. Or yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the song that comes up is Liberace, I'll Be Seeing You. Yeah. Which we heard earlier in the movie. How often does this happen to Paul Sheldon that he sees Annie Wilkes? Uh, oh, I think for the rest of his life. I think so, too. Yeah, yeah I mean, the, the, the hobbling and the cane, he will never forget her. It, she's always going to be a part and i think he's right which i think is fa the fantastic ending of this movie which is why the movie works better if he did go write this other thing because she had to put him through some shit because he was he was not appreciative of the fact that misery like lauren bacall tells him near the beginning of the movie in that flashback put his kids through put braces on their kid bottom two houses he hated her yeah he had to learn how to appreciate her in order to be able to break the cycle of writing these things and move on to something else. So in a colossally fucked up way, the experience um, was essential to him being able to put her to bed misery once and for all and understand the effect that character had on people so that he could move on to something else with a little more grace and humility uh, in his approach. And maybe that's why this book that he wrote uh, will, is getting the rave reviews because we don't know what that book he wrote that Annie burnt. We don't know the response, what the response was going to be to that book. We never find out because he burnt it. This one, right. I imagine, is better because of that's the experience what I think, yeah. of Annie Will. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, you obviously, we'll never see that other book, but I think, I think this book, the implication is that it's a masterpiece. But I also think... Yeah. That Paul Sheldon is never 
going to be the same, obviously. I mean, I think Annie Wilkes is going to haunt him literally for the rest of his days. And it's really upset. It's a disturbing ending to a movie, even though he, he gets away, you know? Yeah. And ironically, it may be her over his shoulder for the rest of his life, um, forcing him to write better. Like he might hear her voice in his head. For the oh, yeah. Rest continually going he didn't get out of the cock duty car <laughs> um it's terrible burn it you can do that <laughs> start over Sorry. so um there was a lot of editing to get this thing just right oh. uh it it opened at 10 million dollars on its opening weekend number two behind home alone oh. and it made uh 61 million domestically Kathy Bates uh, won the Oscar for Best Actress. My yeah. understanding, I think, is this is the only Stephen King novel ever to win an Oscar. Wow. I think. And I was, I was okay. doing a little research to check to see if that's true, but that is what I read. Um, he puts this in his, it's one of his favorites of his books turned into movies. Two of the other in the kind of top three are Shawshank and Stand By Me. Mm. Um, I was looking at just sort of the, you know, Rotten Tomatoes kind of stuff. It's not nearly as well reviewed as I think it should be. Mm-hmm. And it is ranked as the number 17, or she is ranked as number 17 on the scariest movie villains of all time. Mm. Um, and that is everything I have on Misery. John, do you have final thoughts? Yeah, final thoughts of this. This is a fantastic film to go back and revisit. If you just want a slice to remember what it was like to do horror in the 1990s and the approach that uh, Rob Reiner took here, who is a clearly a master filmmaker in terms of the fact that he has been successful in multiple genres. So seeing his take on horror, sometimes someone who's not a dyed in the wool horror director can have some fantastic points of views and interesting new approaches into horror. And I think this film certainly conveys that. And because Rob Reiner is very well aware of male female relationships. If you remember when Harry met Sally and the yeah. princess bride, that experience comes into play here in this male-female relationship between Paul and Annie, this codependent relationship that establishes uh, between them in the most unsettling and uh, scary circumstances brought on by Annie Wilkes. And then what it leads to at the end is that she will always stay in his life. So there are many lessons to learn here out of this movie. Uh, appreciate anything that gets you into a position where you can be successful. And second, never spit on the fans never spit on the fans. <laughs> um, and the third thing is always follow your compass, always follow your compass, your true North compass. You never know where it's going to lead you. Uh, and, uh, stay away, from, stay away from unsettling situations for God's sake. So I think the film endures for so many reasons and deserves to, uh, because of the writing, the directing, the acting, um, and the overall vibe of this film, uh, that should not, that is very difficult to do consolidated into essentially one area for a majority of the film, but it works because of everybody involved bringing their a game. So yeah, it's one of the un most unique horror films ever in the history of horror films. So the first thing is you made me think of the Rob Reiner couples of buttercup and Wesley, <laughs> Harry and Sally and Annie and Paul. Yeah. <laughs> Those are some interesting couples. Um, for me, I think when I think about craftsmanship and you, everyone who's listened to the show knows that craftsmanship means so much to me, mm. this is the kind of movie I'm thinking about is yeah. that every single detail, every single shot is there for a reason. The music works perfectly. The performances are so specific. The storytelling is so great. James Kahn's minimalism and everything that plays behind his eyes, his, all his thought process you have to, you go through and the craziness of annie wilkes who's really turned into an even more ambiguous character as we've discussed her yeah. and what uh kathy bates does with that performance that indelible performance and the way that tension is created in this movie where it's mostly a guy sitting in a bed or sitting yeah. at a typewriter is absolutely amazing it's it is a super super tight well done movie and i will definitely watch this one many 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 times before i'm done so that's what we think of misery we'd love to hear what you think of it visit us on our facebook page you can search for the cinephiles or cine underscore files on twitter cinephiles podcast on instagram and if you want to subscribe to the show 
and I don't understand why you haven't done it already, you should go to Apple <laughs> Podcasts or Spotify or Overcast or YouTube and subscribe there. Please leave your reviews. They really do still help. We're doing so much more on Patreon.com slash The Cinephiles, as we mentioned at the top of the show. So please support us there. You can do it for as little, I think, as 99 cents or a dollar a month. A dollar a month, guys. Come on. I mean, that's that's not that much. Um, and if you want to buy or stream Misery along with every other movie we've ever reviewed, you can do it on cinephiles.net. And you can reach me at SR Morris on Twitter, SR Morris one on Instagram. And we are almost done with Star Trek, the original series on Enterprise Incidents. John, how would people find you? You can find me at The Roca Says on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok, The Outlaw Nation on Twitch, uh, and my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash John Roca Says. We do a lot of stuff there. And um, and my other podcast, The Top Ten, uh, The Geek Buddies, and uh, The Hot Mic, uh, out there for you to listen to. So that's it for this week, and we will be back next time with another great film right here on The Cinephiles. <laughs> <laughs>